William Hopefully, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Good afternoon and welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet and I'm here in the studio with Laurent Landis. And I think we just lost our guest on the line. Um, oh, no. Before we get to her, um, and you can do this while I'm reestablishing our connection. Uh, let me get it over here, otherwise it won't go on the line. Um, no, don't don't get it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. Okay. But you can talk about how successful all of our guests were so, in the primary. I was noticing before the show, looking at the winners... You know, we just had a primary here in the state of Texas, and it looks like every uh, person that we've had on our show as a guest won or at least or is in a runoff for their seat. Um, here's some of them. Lori Burt, she is running in District 3. She's in a runoff. So congratulations to her, former Lambda Weekly guest. Let's see who else has been on. Lupe Valdez. Okay, so Loopy is uh, in a runoff. She won. Oh, she's in a uh, runoff <clears throat> for the governorship of the state of Texas. Let's see who else. I'm going down a list here. There. Um, okay, so Mark Ferris, Mel Ju Julie. I mentioned Julie. Mark Ferris. Lupe. Lupe. I mentioned Lupe. Uh, and she said she'd come back on, so we'll see if we can get her. Uh, awesome. if she's going to be in town on a Sunday. Uh, Lori Birch. Um, in addition, Jessica Gonzalez uh, won her primary in a landslide. And uh, she has no opponent in the fall, so she increases the lesbian caucus by 50%. So is, is Lambda Weekly like the Buddha? Yes. We're, we're like the uh, Buddha belly? Yes. So I want to congratulate our guest, uh, Valerie Hefner. Valerie, are you there? Valerie, can you hear me? Very low. Um, it is very low. It is very low. And why is it doing that? Um, that is the phone line that we have on. Well, keep going, and we're going to try to correct that. So basically, oh, here's another one, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Oh, she, sure, she's been on. <laughs> she's been on. She, she, she's, uh, she won her district, of course. Um, so, how was he, how, is she on now? Uh, so, yeah, can you hear us now? No, it's not. And it is not, huh? We're, well, we're trying to keep. We're going to keep trying to get her on the air. Okay, now can you hear us, Valerie? some technical difficulties and I don't know if Valerie can you hear us hmm I'm gonna call her one more time okay okay while he's calling let's go down some of the other uh, not, not, not some of the former lambda weekly guests but just some of the uh, some of the racists <clears throat> Uh, we we did mention Mark Ferris. He's been on our show also. Okay, I'm on the phone And line. he is the projected winner, first-time runner. Congratulations uh, to him. He is now going to go head-to-head -head with Angela Paxton. I was a little surprised in that win. Um, I thought that Philip Huffines, um, who's running on the Republican side, would actually win that one, but he did not. So it's going to be Ms. Paxton against Mark Ferris. Should be an interesting race. Uh, let's see. Here are some of the other ones. Trying to make sure. Okay, Valerie, can you hear us? I don't think you're on the air either. Valerie, can you hear us? Now you are. I'm on the air, but she's not. Okay, now can you uh, hear us, Valerie? Yeah. Uh, you're not going out over the air, though. Hmm, that's the problem. Um, hmm. Let me try one more thing. Okay, Valerie, are you there? I'm here. Yay. Yay, we got you on. Okay. I don't know what I was doing. Uh, you know, it's one of those things here at KNON. Uh, we have technical difficulties sometimes. And, I understand. Yeah, so I, even though I pushed the exact same button 17 times, 
Seventeenth <laughs> times it the charm. It happens at my job too. Oh uh, well, yeah. Um, this is what happens when our board operator is out. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and we leave things to me, Mister um, High Tech Mechanical, because we're, we're just high tech. But you figured here. it out. Yeah, I did. So, um, this is Valerie Hefner uh, for all of our listeners. She is running for the state legislature uh, in Sherman. Uh, what district number is that? It's District 62. 62, and it encompasses uh, your county and the two counties next to you. Uh, and I had them and in my mind, and I can't think of what they are. I know one is Delta County. Mm -hmm. And the other one is going to be Fannin. Fannin, and then your own county where Sherman and Denison are. Correct. Okay, so congratulations on winning your primary with 100% of the vote. That's impressive, Thank you isn't so it? Thank so much. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, now, I was actually really excited to see it. It sounds stupid, but, um, you know, I had a friend that took a picture of her TV and was like, look what I just seen on TV, and I was like, wow. Right. I didn't. <laughs> right, it's I didn't a, think they'd put any numbers for me. <laughs> right, I know. Uh, you know, it's just one of those uh, because one person showed up, you won. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, now you heard what we were saying. All of the candidates who had been guests on this show won. So we're congratulating you in advance. Don't break our record. So see, you have this hanging Thank over you, you now for the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, d didn't mean to put pressure on. Um, no. You've never run for political office before. Correct. I never wanted to. And you never even <laughs> thought about it, did you? No. Okay, so um, Valerie has four kids. Uh, one of her kids is a gay son. She has two straight sons. Uh, she has a trans daughter. And um, that's kind of what inspired you to run. But first of all, I want to ask, you have almost all the letters in your family, but you don't have a B. No. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So that, that's the attitude. Uh, we're working on it. So We don't know yet, you know? <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. One of them could be. Um, tell us the story of uh, about Ari, your trans daughter, and what inspired you to run for the legislature. It's not what most moms uh, end up doing, but you just no, couldn't take I, it. Yeah. No, I just, I felt helpless. Um, you know, Ari came out as a uh, trans, well, she told me she was transgender when she was nine. Um, and it just really wasn't too big of a surprise for me. Mm -hmm. um, she's number four in line of all, you know, biological mm -hmm. boys. And of course, boys do go through phases where they play with dolls, they do those things, and it means absolutely nothing besides they, you know, seen it and thought it was cool to play with. Mm -hmm. Um, but Ari, at about two and three years old, started going to, through the phases, and it was a little different than the other uh, children. It was um, much more involved, and it was much more elaborate, and it was all the time. And so it never really went away. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, at the time, I wasn't really familiar with the term transgender, and I never really even thought um, that that might be the case with, with her. I just kind of assumed that she was an effeminate gay male, mm -hmm. and so much to the point that I was actually um, preparing her biological dad for the realization at about five or six that this, you know, may be something you need to start making your peace with now. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually talked to um, my mom, which was, you know, obviously her grandma, um, because she's very Southern Baptist woman, and, and let her know, you know, you might need to start making some, um, some you know, how are you going to feel about this? <laughs> because, you know, we could very well be looking at this. And, you know, I wasn't really surprised when she answered back that, you know, she already had been because she had already noticed too. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of on the same page there and we just let things kind of unfold as they did. We never asked any questions or um, made it even, you know, like an issue. And I would notice about in the, the let's see, I'd say it was probably the third grade. She started, um, she had only girlfriends and she would come home and talk about, you know, how she wished that she could wear something that her friend wore to school. And she would come home and take off all of the 
clothes that I bought her for school that were, you know, traditional boy clothes. And she would take my headscarves and anything that she could find around the house. And I, I used to have an elaborate headscarf uh, collection. And, and thanks to, to my child, I don't anymore because <laughs> she would use them as tops and she would make her own skirts and, you know, basically make her own clothes out of my headscarf. And she did that very solid for about, well, for through the whole year of the, the third grade. Mm-hmm. And then finally over the summer, um, my son actually came out as gay at, when she was in third grade. At the, you know, about the mid third grade, he came out as gay. How old was and he at, at one time? Po- he was 14. Okay. And so she came to me, I guess, a couple months after he came out and said, you know, Mom, I think I might be gay, too, because I like boys, too. And I said, well, okay, that's fine. And, you know, that's, if it, that is the case, then that's the case. And, you know, the whole thing that we do, love you with who, how you are, mm-hmm. and, and who you love is who you love. And then it was, it was only about two months after she told me that when she came back to me into the summer uh, of, you know, that third grade year and said, well, I'm actually not gay because... I don't feel like I'm a boy at all in my soul. I feel like my soul is a girl's soul that went into a boy's body, and I don't know why it did, but it did because I, I'm a girl. And so I'm not really gay. I just I like boys because I'm supposed to be a girl. And isn't that a and, kind of poetic way for a nine-year-old to put it? Uh, I have the soul of a girl. Yes, that is exactly the word she said. Is yeah. I have the soul of a girl, and it went into a boy's body. Did not, so, did that kind of take the wind out of you? You know, it you, it should have, but it kind of didn't. It just it it, it kind of made sense mm-hmm. um, because living with her for her entire life, it was it was not a question that she really felt that way. It wasn't like, I felt like she was confused. I didn't feel like she, this was out of nowhere that she was making it up. It was actually kind of a missing puzzle piece, if you will. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh, okay. So a lot of things make sense now. Right. Um, you know, there, I am used to seeing uh, men that you would call, you know, effeminate gay males that, you know, do enjoy a little bit of sparkle every now and again. But this, I mean, this child was coming home and literally living as a woman all evening long and then having to transform back into someone else to go to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. and, and, and that's probably more difficult than anything. I mean, that must have been a very odd period because I know other transgender people that I know, their transition is tough. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And that's an adult doing it. So for a nine-year-old, well, maybe for a nine-year-old since it was so normal and she figured it out so early, maybe that was actually, that actually might have made it easier for her. Well, it would have. I, but when we, I, actually that summer, and I call it my, I do, I call it my school year of shame because um, what happened is I went into the school that, over that summer and I talked to the principals and the counselors because she wanted to go to the fourth grade as Ari. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they kind of talked me out of it because of how kids act and the way parents act and her age. And then they even wanted to bring Ari in and talk to her face on. And, you know, I'm kind of trying to navigate this as well and not really, you know, not understanding some, but not the the level of detriment that it can cause Mm -hmm. if you're not affirming. And so they kind of talked us both out of her transitioning into in the fourth grade and waiting until she went on to fifth grade because she'd be going to a new school and everybody would be a little older and maybe, you know, they just really, if, but when you when I go back and replay the conversation in my head, it was they just didn't want to deal with it because it was, you know, I just want uh, Ari to have a great last school year here and remember our school years fondly and I don't want, you know, and, and I don't know that it was necessarily had anything to do with Ari when I play back the conversation. It was more of, oh no, we don't want to deal with this. If we could just make it one more year, they can deal with it when she goes it, to, you yeah, know. They can deal with it school. over there in that other right. school because yeah. they're making it sound like, yeah, when she's in fifth grade, oh, they're mature. Right, right. So, So, I mean, they kind of bullied us into, you know, not transitioning. So for school, I went and bought gender neutral clothes that Mm -hmm. were just, you know, jeans and and neutral type shirts and things like that. And she went to school in gender neutral clothes, but she would still come home in the evening 
and she would take off the new gender neutral clothes and again start crafting scar- uh, scarves and the skirts and and things like that and about halfway through the school year she you know would come home and she would cry and she would tell me it's so hard because my friends don't know who I really am and mm-hmm. that's what she kept telling me she says I feel like I'm lying to my friends because that I can't be real friends with them if they don't know who I am for real and I feel like I'm lying to everybody so it was a horrible school year for her I felt like I had to drag her through it I had to drag myself through it I was very angry that you know I had let them bully us to that that point that I hadn't stand, stood up and and been more firm so um thank was God part of it just, just just to be fair uh because that's how I am Right, Lauren. Mm-hmm. I'm always I'm always neutral. Um, could it be partially that they just didn't have any experience with other transgender kids? It was, it was absolutely that they they okay. had never run into it, and they and they told us that they you know they weren't they didn't hide that fact that they didn't know what they were doing. So, um, so how come they didn't in, know how to accommodate? You know, Sherman's a pretty big city. How come there has never been a transgender kid in Sherman? Could it be the water? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Since Now, since she has gone to the new school in fifth grade, I mean, I found one other child that was here um, before her that was in another elementary school mm-hmm. um, that they were, you know, were dealing with that child. But they were not dealing with that child at all in the way that they needed to. It was actually, I, I think, one of the reasons why I was able to be bullied into her not transitioning was because of how bad this other child's experience was in that other elementary school. Mm. Um, that other child was um, being called, you know, called the wrong name all the time, even though they were asking not just the child, but the parents to not do that. They would, they would still refer to the child as the wrong name. They would still force that child into the boy's bathroom. Um, mm. They would actually physically remove that child from the girl's bathroom. And I knew all this was going on in the other elementary school, which is why I think I, one of the reasons why I was I was so easily bullied into, well, let's just keep it under wraps one more year. Yeah. And, well, and the, you and, know, and, the, we need to take a quick break, but um, you know, maybe that year gave you that extra strength that you needed to go into that new school year. You, you Absolutely. Know, guns blazing. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. And that, I guess that's a, a bad metaphor to say guns anything when it has to do with the school but uh you know what i mean we need to take a break uh i'm dave taffet i'm here in the studio with Lauren landis lake patty fink has the day off um Lauren, did did uh, patty tell us what she's doing today she has some extra work oh she has extra work oh so so patty works all of a sudden um (laughs) we all got to pay bills uh and our guest is valerie hefner she is running for the texas legislature from sherman and we'll be back with more lambda weekly right after this sponsored by texas cost and i really truly believe 89.3 and lambda weekly are not only adding to my life but they're changing lives so why don't you at this point when they need your help financially call they're going to give you the numbers call in and donate so that we can perpetuate the future that is now i'm dallas city okay so i played the wrong bumper (laughs) that it's not it's not pledge drive don't call in except for you valerie uh (laughs) yeah um everything if it has to do with this board today i'm it's jinxed. I'm Dave Taffet. I'm here with Lauren Landis, and we're talking to Valerie Hefner, who's running for um, state legislature, uh, District 62 up in Sherman, yep. uh, and the next two counties going east from there. Um, okay, so Valerie, so you're going into fifth grade. It's a new school. Um, that's it's, Is it a middle school, or is it just a fifth and sixth grade school? It's just fifth and sixth grade. It's an intermediate mm-hmm. school. Okay. Uh, but, yeah. And how did you deal with that school? Um, they were getting two trans kids, huh? They were. They were going to be getting two trans kids. Which is great. Um, yes. Which for, was for the two kids. Great because for the kids, because I thought, oh, great. There'll be at least someone she can, um, you know, maybe, I, you know, I didn't, you know, hook up with and have a, a buddy, a friend. Mm-hmm. Because that was a problem really for her at that time. 
um, because she felt like no one knew who she really was. Mm-hmm. Um, meantime, of course, we were getting in contact with some people. I, got, I got a hold of a group in Dallas. They're, they're just now they're got a for profit, or excuse me, non profit. Um, Texas, it's uh, DFW Trans Kids and Families, and there's about 300 families in there now. But at the time, there was about 200. So during that summer, I had gone to several socials that they hold uh, where you can get where we get the kids together and the parents can get together and talk. So I, I definitely was emboldened through them that you know this was a real deal. This isn't you know people are going to come at you, and these are the things to expect. Um, so you know I kind of had that in my arsenal before I went into uh, talking to the school going into fifth grade and. When I went into the fifth grade, I immediately called in, you know, like the superintendent over the school board and, and, you know, not just the principals and the counselors of that school. I wanted it to be up. You know, everybody across the board needs to get on, on board because she's going to be in this school system, you know, through her entire school career. Sure. And we're not going to do this. We're not going to, to hide anymore. Right. So, and, and that uh, way, yeah, she's just who she is. Yes. You, you don't have to go to school with her and explain and you right, know, it's, it's, right. Here she is. Yeah, I, I mean, really, I really wanted it to be um, her to be able to go in the first day and for everyone to know her situation um, beforehand. And now I, I suggested you know getting the staff together and putting them all on the same page so that when the first day comes, that there's not a huge hitch and. You know, that there's people that are keeping an eye on the situation and making sure that she's not being picked on or bullied or, you know, relentlessly. But um, it actually went better than I uh, planned for it to when we first went in. Now, that first fifth grade year was still very hard on her. She mm-hmm. went as Ariana, and she that, that year she did not have access to the girls' bathroom. She was uh, allowed to use the nurse's restroom. Um, and what I noticed was that just about the kids time, the kids would kind of forget um, any extra and just, you know, look at this child as Ari. One of them would see her or, or ask her, you know, how come you have to go to the nurse's room? And it would bring all mm-hmm. the questions back up again. Yep. Um, and yeah. And so she, you know, halfway through fifth grade year was like, you know, I don't understand why I have to be the trans girl Mm -hmm. why can't i just be a girl like you know if people would just stop asking me questions it would really be nice and and she said and i she's very patient aria was very patient the year that we didn't uh, you know transition uh she was very patient with anybody who had questions it just kind of got to a point where it was like well people would quit asking questions if people quit treating me a certain way mm-hmm. and and she was right um it's in every situation we've ever been in whether it's a classroom a bus um if the kids act accordingly uh to adult to the adults mm-hmm. if the adults act like there's nothing going on and there's nothing different here that's how the kids act if the parents act like there's something weird or un- unreasonable going on, then that's when kids get curious and start asking questions. Mm-hmm. Because kids just are blind to anything besides who's right there in front of them. They see the real you until you tell them different. Mm-hmm. So um, the only problem we had that first year was really just the school bathroom. And it was, you know, with, you know going back and forth with them. Uh, with, you know, if y'all would just let her go to the bathroom, a lot of this would go away. Uh, this would die out. And um, so over the next summer, we're going going to go into sixth grade, you know, and we're, you know. So this is, last, on these, this is last summer, right? Last summer, yeah. yes. And we're going through the sessions and we're, you know, and I'm, I'm watching all of them online and I'm watching, you know, cohorts not pay any attention to the parents, the clergymen, the physicians, anybody. Who's and you're talking about the people again. down in the legislature who uh, yes. wasted months doing nothing months. but try to legislate bathrooms. Months and money. Legislate bathrooms and just money, just hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging yep. money over these bathrooms. And it's why are y'all so concerned about what is going I mean, we're talking about stalled bathrooms mm-hmm. at school. And, you know, one of the things that I think people are so, it's just education. It's like the, the first thing they'll say is, well, I don't want my little girl to accidentally see, you know, 
her, you know, your child's genitals or whatever. And because that can, happens all the time in a ladies' room, yeah, doesn't it? Women you know, always. It does. It, it, and I've you never know, been in a ladies' room. There's a boob. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Lauren and I haven't been in ladies' rooms. Lauren has a daughter, but you used to take her when she was little into the oh, men's room with yeah. you. Uh -huh. Okay, so we've never seen a ladies' room, but what we imagine is that the first thing women do is show each other their boobs. Then right? they pull down their pants, <laughs> and then they go into a private stall and pee. Do, do I have that right? right? I don't. Yeah, that's what they must think happens. But <clears throat> it really frustrated me because I thought, you know, if you had just a, just a little Google search, man, will show you <laughs> that the, this child is going to be covering, binding, hiding yep. these genitals more than any other cat kid <clears throat> is anyway. So you're not going to need to legislate locker room you don't need to do that because the last person who's going to go in a locker room with a body that they feel dysphoria in and change in front of a group of their peers it's not going to happen they hit about 14 13 years old and they become very aware of the parts of their body that they're not happy with so if they don't want them they don't want anyone else to see them mm -hmm. and they're very embarrassed and ashamed by it so it's like you don't need to put these targets on these kids' back. You don't need to put to legislate the bathrooms or the locker rooms because I guarantee that child that is suffering through gender dysphoria is going to do everything in their power to make sure their peers don't notice that they're different. Mm -hmm. So it's it's frustrating. So if we could jump, let's j jump over to your son, your oldest son. You said is gay. Is that correct? Correct. So now that means around this, I guess he's going on 15 or 16. Right. Okay, so that puts him in high school, you know. Up, right. You know, uh, even though it's more common now, my husband is a school teacher, and he tells me every year he has one or two openly gay students. So it's much more right. acceptable than when I was back in junior high and in high school. But kids can right. still be bullied about that. Um, oh, yeah. How, how have things gone for him? Um, per Desmond has always been very strong as far as mentally and physically. He's always been very athletic. Um, that uh, He, to be honest, was the one who a uh, surprise. When he told me he was gay, I did, it, well, he was flying under the radar. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that one caught me off guard. <laughs> <laughs> that one actually caught me off guard a little bit because there were, you know, there were none of these stereotypical or you know mm -hmm. things that people think that you might see i mean and there were none and he was it did kind of i mean i'm not gonna lie because when he told me some things just kind of made sense as mm -hmm. far as his personality who he is as a person the fact that he hadn't been interested really in girls and you know there were just things a softness about him i guess that it's like okay that does make sense you know i see it mm -hmm. but I, one thing i will say about that child is um, he went from, and he's always been since he was little, I mean, he was so shy. I mean, he's just so painstakingly shy and so uncomfortable in his, in his own skin um, until he came out. I mean, I drug him into the kindergarten the first year, for, for the first five weeks, literally. Drug him in, kicking and screaming. He just did not want to go. And it, it never, it got better uh, as far as wanting to go, but he never really made a lot of friends. He didn't get real deeply involved in a lot of uh, um, other interactions with other kids. He was very closed off, uh, very shy, and just uncomfortable in his own skin. And I hated that for him. He was just mm -hmm. awful. And, and the, it's like he came out and within a month, it was a complete turnaround. This child went from you know, staying in his room and not really having much to do with anybody and kind of, you know, uh, not really upset, but what you would just say, just kind of a downer to just a completely different person in a matter of a month. He was happy. Uh, coming out. In other words. Yeah, he was just completely different, happy child. And and I thought, and I asked him, I said, so how long have you known? Because, I mean, the, the change was so immediate. I said, well, how long have you known that you were gay? And he said, well, I didn't, I didn't really know, but I really started to suspect around 12 oh, okay. that I, yeah. so for two years, he kind of was hiding from that. And mm -hmm. actually he did the whole self-hate thing for like six months after he mm -hmm. came out. I mean, just crying and I don't want to be this way. And, 
you know, I let him have his grieving time for a couple months, and then I finally just set him down and was like, look, man, like, we're not going to do the whole self-loathing thing. Like, either you're going to get okay with this, or I'm taking you to therapy because, mm-hmm. you, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing has changed. Nothing about you has changed. This means nothing, and and who you love is who you love, and, you know, we're just not going to do that. We're not going to We're not gonna hate ourselves because of who we are, and... If you can't get past this on your own, then I'm going to get you some professional help to help sure. you work through it. And, you know, then he kind of started coming out of it. So, so, his, so, so his peers and school, everybody seems to be generally okay with it? Um, not, the, not when he came out in the eighth grade. He was actually in the eighth grade, which would be like uh, the middle school here. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't, you know, he got a lot of crap from people who um, called themselves his friends. Um, he got a little bit of crap from people who were the athletic type jocks, but he's always been a, like I said, a strong kid mm-hmm. and he's not afraid to, you know, buck back and say, Hey, you know, if you want to go, let's go. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, at the right. end of the day. <laughs> so, I mean, it didn't last long because he's just has the personality type of he's going to shut it down, mm-hmm. you know, and so many kids don't, but he does. And he's right. just like, you know, I, I, this changes nothing about, you know, my guns on my arms. I'm mm-hmm. going to punch you in the face. Right. <laughs> and it's like, right. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, well, son. <laughs> and does he have any gay friends in school or is he the only um, one who's come out in his class? He's not the only one. There is a couple other that have come out. And, of course, you know, interestingly enough, there are there were lots of kids that um, it, it was weird, especially in, his, in the eighth grade, that would send him secret or, like, not secret messages, but uh, private messages and mm-hmm. ask him, like, well, how did you know? And it would, mm-hmm. it would be other young men that I think were trying to fill out, like, mm-hmm. um, is this what I'm going through? And, and you know oh, something? It's really tough to come out when you don't have a role model. When you have no, and by role model, I don't just mean the teacher, uh, but I mean other peers who who are also coming out um, because you don't know what it is, really. No. Um, No. I know when I was in high school, it was funny. There were uh, four of us who were very friendly, and none of us came out in high school, but all of us came out in college. But, you know, we just gravitated toward each other. And so we had that gaydar working uh, and and we found each other. But, you know, we didn't come out because, you know, I'm in my extremely late 30s. So back in the 19 (laughs) late 1960s, early 70s, when I was in school, um, why are people laughing when I mention how old I am? Um, uh, You know, we, we didn't have that that peer uh, who had come out what we did have was the drama teacher in high school who looked out after all the gay kids he, he knew there exactly yeah he knew who, who we were we knew who he was and but he he did a great job of looking out for all of us made sure That's we great. weren't bullied made sure that you know that that we were okay but no. yeah yeah but I, right, right. I, I understand why he had a tough time and it's not because even that he thought so much there was something wrong with him although i guess he did if he's different than everybody else but because he didn't have that other peer right there was no one yeah and and it's great that he's acting as that figure for other kids so it's really funny that you say that that everybody kind of gravitates together and it's really true and i i I tell myself all the time you know i i have the kids i have because uh the universe or, or god or whatever is up there no knew that i was the one who could handle it because growing up actually in like fourth grade i ended up i had a boyfriend at the time Mm -hmm. that was really pretty (laughs) and then as we got into and of course we were only in fourth grade and that that didn't last but we remained friends well by the time we were in high uh middle school that friend started uh, very much uh, becoming very feminine, you know, drawing on eye, eyes, you know, ma- uh, eyebrows and mm-hmm. wearing girl jeans and things like that. And we didn't have a word for it, but that was just, you know, who that person was. Mm-hmm. And I also had another friend that ended up being a best friend all through high school that ended up finally coming out when uh, he got to college as well. So it's almost like these people kind of gravitated towards me even 
uh, when I was younger, um, sure. but it, it, I never was one. It's I was just taught by my mom, even though she's, it's so weird. She's so Southern Baptist, but her, her main, you do not judge anyone and you be kind to everyone. That mm-hmm. is just how my mom is. Sure. But my mom also raised three biracial children in the 80s in District 62. Now, a lot of people don't really think that's a big deal, but this geographic, no, <laughs> this area in, in District 62 in the 80s, we were about the only biracial kid that you've seen. Mm-hmm. And my mom had a very hard time. Um, find, she, Matter of fact, she never did find a church home that she was comfortable in. Um, if she would go to a, a white church, the people would look at her kids and, and judge her. And when she went to a black church, people would look at her and they'd look at her different and her kids. And, you know, things would be said about us behind our backs. So she never found a church home that she felt accepted into. And so she watched her church at home on TV every weekend. She would just turn on the First Baptist Church and, in the house and she would sit on the couch with her Bible. And wait, 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 wait. First Baptist Church in Dallas? In Sherman. Oh, okay. So it was okay. Because I was yeah, going to say, would. I was going to say, First Baptist Church here, not the most accepting, unless your name is Trump. No, no, <laughs> it's a, no, no, no. It's a First Baptist Church of Sherman, and I, I'm really not even sure, you know, how open or whatever they were back then. But that's how she would do her church because she, she didn't, didn't have find to put a church up from, with, Yeah, she didn't have to put up with right. everybody else. So some. So. Yeah, sometimes I think the whole you be kind to everybody no matter what, you know, no matter what other people say, because, you know, if you go by that, the, the good book, there are people who actually interpret just my being conceived, I'm an abomination mm-hmm. because I'm a mix right. of two races. Yep. But she had to deal with that. So I kind of feel like that's where the, the, the part of her that is okay and was able to accept uh, gay and trans grandchildren kind of came into and she's been able to work it out in her faith somehow to where she's okay sure and, and valerie we need to take one more break uh you're listening to lambda weekly on kon fm 89.3 i'm dave taffet i'm here with Lauren landis patty will be back with us next week our guest is valerie hefner she is running for the state legislature and right after the break we'll explain how having a trans kid developed into running for the legislature um and you know valerie one thing that you said was that um you were you got your kids and they are who they are because they just had the right mom there are so many gay and lesbian and transgender kids who didn't have the right mom that was this accepting and it's wonderful to see when a parent just loves her kids because they're my kids. I mean, that's how I was yeah. brought up, yep. but right. I, I know so many people who did not have that. Let's take our uh, quick break, and we'll be back with more right after this. I'm Dallas City Councilman Adam Adrano, and you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. And this is Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. We're talking to Valerie Hefner. Uh, she's a mama bear. And that, that's, a, that's a new category that we just love. Those are mamas who protect their kids and love their kids for who they are and doesn't put up with any kind of garbage from anybody else. Um, no. So it, it was the beginning of the school year this year, and Ari, your trans daughter, didn't want to use the nurse's bathroom this year. Right. And she'd been telling me that all summer. And so what did so- you do? Well, I, I really just put um, the superintendent on my call schedule for about every two weeks. I would give her a call over the summer and say, hey, have you figured out what you're going to do about Ariana mm-hmm. next year? Because there was no policy on the books at all. Mm-hmm. It was going by uh, school district to school district to school district. They were kind of letting them uh, choose their own ways and choose their own paths. And I, you know, was coming at them with, you know, hey, there's uh, schools in Frisco that were allowing it last year. They've had no problems. There's been schools here that are having no problems. So I would just call her about every two weeks and, you know, hey, have you figured out what you're going to do yet? Because there's really no, bo- there's no policy. There's nothing on the book. But like, what are y'all going to do with y'all's policy? What's your policy? Just over and over and over, try to pin down, like, what are y'all going to do? And uh, really, you know, not much came of it besides I just bugged them at all through the summertime enough mm-hmm. that they knew that I was going to be very, very vocal about it is really what it kind of boiled down to. 
So when school started for uh, her going into sixth grade, I said, you know, just go to the girls' room and let's just see what happens. And if something happens, I'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so she started going into um, the girls' bathroom, and she had been for about two months. And we had no problem. And you, you mean she went to the girls' bathroom and nothing happened? Nothing happened. <laughs> nothing she happened. Like, she peed and came out, and huh. it was just that. Oh, wow. Imagine that. <laughs> you know, you should write an article about that. <laughs> or, or maybe we the should do a whole news story. She peed and came out she of the bathroom. Out, huh? <laughs> wow. So then what happened? So a teacher caught, it caught her going into the girls' bathroom about two months into the school year and, uh, and you know, told her, you know, you are not allowed to go in there and sent her down to the counselors. And, the, you know, the counselor called me and I immediately left work and, and, and went up there and was like, just basically begging on hands and knees and, and bawling, like, do not mess with her. She has been fine for two months. Nobody said anything. The one person who did say something was an adult. I am tired of your, of an adult perverse mind being and trying to infuse that into these children. And it's not right. We haven't had any issues. And I told him, I said, now we can revisit this again if we do have some issues. Mm -hmm. But until then, leave her alone. Right. And 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 they did. They so, left her alone. So none of the kids complained that uh, no. that she was going into the bathroom, and not at all. And really, nothing happened. She went in. She peed. She left. That's what you do in a bathroom. Washed her hands, hopefully before she went back to class. But that's right. about it, right? That's it. That okay. is it. And so, so um, since then, she's been going to the girls' restroom, and her this school year has been great for her she's made so many friends um she's actually stayed uh, the night at a sleepover birthday party where and i never let her go anywhere else i don't i know that that is okay i mean i know some people choose to go that path i i choose not to go that path because i i am an anxious mother and in my mind anything that could go wrong can mm -hmm. and my fear is somebody finding out and I'm not there to protect her or them feeling like they've been deceived or oh my god this you know child has been here asleep with five girls and what's happened and you know none of that bull crap and that pervish stuff that adults think about mm -hmm. and I don't want her in that situation so I've never let her go and stay the night at a slumber party or sleepover unless all the parents knew the deal you know like this is how it's going to be you're going to know before she goes and she had you know no problem they still wanted her to come she still had a great time i okay so in over there so not only did she go into the bathroom pee wash her hands and go to class the way it's supposed to work she went to a slumber party at a friend's house yeah. and the parents understood the situation and it wasn't a problem none they, you know, no creepy things happened, you know, no, nothing. They just, like, tried to lip sync all night and do that stuff like girls do and have, hair, you know, like, terrible makeup, you know, mm -hmm. makeovers, and that was that. I mean, they had they had a great time. Yeah, Warren Laron, yeah. his daughter's just getting to that age. <laughs> she is. Oh, gosh, it's so terrible right now. Mm -hmm. It's so terrible. It's, it's way worse than what we ever experienced because now they try to contour, and it's like, what are you contouring? <laughs> I didn't even know that phrase at your age. Right. What is that? Exactly. <laughs> so in the mix of all this, when was it that you decided, I think I need to run for office? Um, I actually, I, it, it wasn't one thing. It was, I, I go back to the universe pushing you in directions that you're supposed to go into. And that is, it's not one thing. And when I try to pin it down to when did I decide, it was when someone said, why don't you run? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I didn't commit that night. I was like, you know... I don't know. I just never thought about me running. I don't really have the back. When I say the background, I don't mean that I have any skeletons, but I'm not a known person in this mm -hmm. community. I've, you know, I've worked hard for the same job since I've started working. I've been around the same people. Um, I, our, my profession is not out in the community, so people don't know me. So mm -hmm. when I say I don't have the background for it, I mean I don't have the, the base. Um, yeah, I don't you have don't the, have the base, political so base. Not, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, you know, why would I 
you know, do that. But then she asked me that question because I'd actually gone to the Democratic Women's uh, of Grayson County. It was a coffee clash. And I actually went just to be around people that were like me because Trump's administration and everything that was going on, I was being strangled. I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I just needed to be around people who weren't weird. And so I went and a lady just asked me, why haven't you haven't you run? Why haven't you done something about it? Why did you know if this is really directing you affect you know affect, affecting you directly? And I went home and I thought about all the things that I've been through the last several months and watching the sessions. And I had jumped on uh, local politics and seeing who was running for office for the midterms. Uh, ended up going to see Beto O'Rourke in Plano. Uh, came out of there with a fire lit out from underneath me and just several different things like that that all kind of just added up to when I was laying there at night. I was like, I think that if I'm sitting here and watching the signs and the signs are written on the wall, that the last probably year before I decided to run, there were just things that were pushing me towards that direction. Mm -hmm. It was pushing me that way. And if I quit resisting it, then you're going to end up where you're supposed to. So I just decided to jump. Now, one thing yeah. that happened over the summer, of course, that this whole special session was uh, consumed with trying to pass a bathroom bill. You weren't able to Correct. get down there and testify, but you watched it online. But you made an right. appointment to go see your representative. I did. How did I'd that actually call, I called him more than once um, on several different numbers and asked him to please just call me. Call me and talk to me. You may not even realize that you have a child in your district that this is affecting directly. Please call me so that we can t talk about it. Maybe you can meet her. Maybe you can see. Let me put a face with what we're talking about. And he didn't call me back. He would not call me back. And I took that was so infuriating to me because it was you're supposed to be everyone's representative. It doesn't matter that we don't fall on, you know, into your, your policy or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're supposed to represent us, too. But, you and know, even if it's not unique uh, here. Last week in Florida, one woman who is in, she's a Republican uh, and a gun supporter uh, in the Florida legislature, the kids from Parkland went to speak to all of the legislators and she stood up and made a speech that included the words to the kids don't you tell me how to vote can you imagine See, and what are you, are you kidding me they're, they're, you're here to represent us that is your job what right. do you mean don't tell you how to vote you're supposed to vote accordingly to how we want and you know i understand that i'm in a district where i may not be the majority but i did I was very, very um, upset that he didn't even give me the courtesy mm -hmm. of picking up the phone and calling me back. Right. If because he's going to vote he, against, if he's going to vote yeah. against you, at least meet my kid and know right. who you're voting at against. Least. Right. Or talk to me about oh, it. Have the, just respond have in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have the courage to tell me why you support that. You know, have the courage to pick up the phone and say, this is why I have to support it because whatever. X, Y, Z reason. Now, he's somebody who has run unopposed for years, right? Yes. Correct. Uh, no more. <laughs> no. Well, and now he's he actually has left the seat and wants to go, I believe, to the 59th district. Uh, he wants to come closer to home and start raising grandkids now, he said. So uh, now uh, I'm actually, fine. the seat is open. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. open. So now the seat is actually open, and I'm running against, um, well, it was three Republicans, and one of them was, uh, you know, recently he, he didn't win in the primary, and now I'm, there's a runoff. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's two of them. Uh, one of them uh, is um, very popular, very known in the community, and a nice man. I'm mm -hmm. not even going to talk bad about it. He's a nice man. He is a conservative man, but he's a nice man. Mm -hmm. um, the other guy... I don't really know him or who he is or where he came from. He doesn't seem as if he's well known in the community, but he is already in his platform. One of his platform uh, things is to keep women in safe in the restrooms and locker rooms, like just blah, right out there. So I already know that if he wins, I got a question last night. Somebody asked me, a con someone who isn't conservative, but was 
um, I think maybe lean in a little bit, had a lot of questions to ask me. And he said, so do you actually want to win or are you making, are you just trying to make a point to leave your kids alone? And I told him, I said, you know what? I have to win. I have to win. I said, it's no longer about whether I want to win or don't want to win. I have to win. I said, because I've already got another guy that's got him for the spot that says, yeah, he's going to push bathroom bills. You know, so I don't get a choice. It's more than that. Are you running for your kid? The answer to that is yes, and I'm running for your kids and your kids. Exactly, because, you know, he actually was more of a, a person that was like, you know, I don't really care about bathrooms. To be honest, I don't really care about guns. I just vote more conservative because of really probably where I went to school was mm -hmm. more of a conservative school. But he, um, the, you know, all when they have to choose the, um, uh, what are those called? Um, oh, shoot. Uh, propositions. You know, he voted no on just about every proposition, and he mm -hmm. said that. He said, I voted no on every proposition. I don't care about who's going in the bathroom. I don't care about any of that. And, and, and so it's like there's this big set of people that really don't care about it. They just vote in the Republican primary because, you know, that's how they grew up, and that's what they, they know. Now, but then when he actually read the propositions, it's like, I don't really agree with any of it. Sure. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the one who... Uh, who, who is against, and you said is well known, but um, you know a reasonable person. If he wins right. the if he wins the runoff, and the two of you enter the race together uh, or against each other, and your debates and everything else just sticks to the issues that you're exactly. not you're not tearing each other apart. It's okay, you know. It, it, it's I've had several people after the primary say to me, um, but I voted for this one. How can you like that one? Well, because they're both right. good people. You know, here in this congressional district where our studio is, uh, it's Pete Sessions' district. And he once right. famously said, I don't have any gay people in his dist in my district. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there, there's several right here in this room. He's so uh, wrong. <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, but on the Democratic side, um, I knew I've met like four of the people who were uh, in the primary. Two very good people are in the runoff. It's okay to have two good candidates and have to choose between two good candidates. Right. That, that's, and a, that's, that's a, a good thing. Problem. That's healthy. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. It is. And, and, and that's really what I want to see is let's stick to the problems because, what, I mean, the fact of the matter is we have really real problems. We really are, you know, have looking at people, a mass amount of people that do not have health care or access to health care. Mm -hmm. We are looking at a massive uh budgeting issue with our school ditch our school district and now we've got people wanting to push these vouchers that are going to just cause that to become even more of a burden on the homeowners that are already holding 60 percent of the bill it's like we have all these other things that really really are happening and imagine how much time we would have to focus our energies on fixing those issues and fixing those problems and making people's lives better if we put our differences aside take our religions out of it take our opinions of what someone else is doing out of it and let's just focus on the issue mm -hmm. and fix the issues and stop making all the divisive stuff and that's another thing that it's like i keep trying to warn everybody about the division they are trying to divide us up i see it happening everywhere even with the women's marches and transgender people and and things like that it's in, in the transgender division within the division I seen a group the other day. It was uh, it blew me away, and I didn't even sit, sit and watch, look at the whole thing. But it was an article apparently about a group of women that are upset because we're t we're stealing, like it said, like save gay females because apparently they're afraid that we're taking uh, gay females and turning them into trans boys. And it's like, oh my god! Now we're fighting within our community, oh, and wow. they're. they're Heard yes, that one. <laughs> yes, it was insane. They are, you know, they had banners in the whole nine yards. Save our gay girls because <laughs> apparently we're oh turning our gay girls into trans boys, and it's like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> so it's like, and and it's so hard when you see it all happening around you, and it mm -hmm. feels like there's only a handful of other people that see it with you. It's so out there in your face and it's like are, do you really don't want to is, is it that you really don't see it or is it that you don't want to see it right. you know and it's, it, it's frustrating Valerie we are just about out of time I want to thank you. This thank is, you this so is, I'm much. sorry about the um, technical at the very beginning. But, no, not at all. Because uh, we lost a minute or two but we're, we're just about out of time. Um, well, 
you're going to win because every candidate who's yep. come on has won. Our guest Yay. last week also yes. uh -huh. uh, <laughs> come from behind on the city council also. Omar. That's right. Yay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so yes. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Don't ruin our record. So you have that hanging I'll over try. you. I'll try. Yeah. But Man, either I'll way, try. please come back sometime. Yeah. And, All right, and come down to the studio, bring the kids. Um, Valerie okay. Hefner, who's running for uh, the state legislature, the House of Representatives District 62, and is a mama bear protecting her kids mm -hmm. up in Sherman. Uh, we will talk to you again soon, Valerie. Thank you so much for All being right. on. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. And uh, next week, our guests are Chris Luna and... No, there's one other person. Oh. I don't know her. Um, okay, then they're talking about a gay and lesbian fun for Dallas event that's coming I'm up. Not for sure. Patty Gay Ryan's so. uh, I know. So where's Patty? Oh, she's not <laughs> here. Uh, we'll be back with more next week and have a good week. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call.